Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another three level series. This one is going to be my three levels of villager trading halls and auto breeders. So villagers, they're they're really great to work with. I really enjoy it. You know, I, I just I find it so relaxing. And you know, I could I could just spend hours just, you know, working with villagers and you know getting their trades going. And they're just they're such a peaceful one up. They don't annoy anything at all. And, um, you know, it's, it's totally fine to just, you know, find a village and you create a peaceful sense of a landscape there. And you can, you can just really relax and have a good time. And I don't think there's really anything wrong with just working solely with villagers. Okay, so I may or may not actually hate working with villagers, but um, I suppose that's any good reason to do this video then. So we're going to be looking at different ways to control villagers, make the trading process with them go smoother and easier, and then we're going to get all the way up to kind of breaking villagers. As always, before we get started, just want to let you know there will be a world download for not this village, but everything that we're going to be going over and you will be able to download these three different designs and look at those for yourself, grab schematics if you want, whatever you want to do there. So look down in the video description for that. So as usual, we're going to start out talking about the mechanics of villager trading and breeding, and then we're going to get into the three different levels. So let's get to it. So like I said, in all seriousness, um, villagers actually are available to trade for a lot of really useful things in the game, some things that aren't really farmable either, um, and they do purchase some things in order to give you those emeralds. So overall, as a feature of villagers, I actually do really like having them in the game. I think they're a great feature to have. I just hate working with them. So this idea in this video is going to be based around, like I said, making it easier to work with them. Over here on this wall, we have a bunch of the really useful items that villagers can trade. They can trade full diamond gear that's enchanted. You can get a bunch of blocks like glass, quartz, glazed terracotta, terracotta. You can get redstone dust that's really useful. You get that from clerics. Uh, you can get glowstone, ender pearls, bottles of enchanting. Those are really nice for if you're going to have AFK farms or if you want to just have some mobile um, elytra mending inside your ender chest, have some of those. Uh, you can get pork chops and golden carrots, which Whatever your preferred method is for eating in the game. I prefer carrots just because you eat less often, but I know technically pork chops are more efficient. It's up to you what you go with because you can end up getting them really cheap. Obviously, they buy all of that stuff for emeralds. And in order to get those emeralds, you can either set up yourself a raid farm, or if you're someone who's not going to want to do raid farming, you can sell all these different things, all this garbage to the villagers. Uh, you can, I mean, probably, arguably, the iron isn't garbage. We can sell them iron. You can sell them sticks. Uh, the diorite, yeah, finally used for diorite, exactly. Um, all these different food types that are easily farmable, whether you set up a little tiny micro farm or you grind them out. Um, you can sell gold to clerics. You know, you may not think that that would be something to sell to them, but at the same time, if you want some of these resources instead of the piglin bartering, you can sell your gold to get your emeralds. Uh, paper, just plain stone. So you get your haste beacon up, you're digging out an area for a base and boom, you got a bunch of stone, sell it to your masons, uh, things like leather. So um, these are really cheap things, you know, but probably string is a little expensive, but if you get a, a spider spawner farm or something, you get a bunch of string out of that. And that can be sold to these guys. So that's what we really want them for is these nice traits. First thing you need to do is find a villager. You can either do that by finding a village and just taking the villagers inside of here. I mean, safely relocating them. Or by finding a wild zombie villager. This is obviously the preferred way on Skyblock. Hitting him with a potion of weakness and then hitting him with a golden apple. He will then turn into just a plain old normal villager. Now he's ready to breed. Obviously, be another villager to do that. But let's talk real quick about the breeding mechanics. Obviously, you're going to need two villagers in order to breed. Each of those villagers is going to need a bed that they can call their own. They are going to need some breeding fuel. So they're going to need three pieces of bread each or 12 carrots each or 12 potatoes each. Then in order to successfully breed. So right now they're going to try breeding, but it's going to fail. 
In order to successfully breed, they need an extra bed for the new baby to lay in, and then it also needs enough blocks above it for the baby to jump on. If they don't think that a baby can jump on this bed, they will not breed. So if we were to cover this up with some blocks, even though it's an available bed, baby can't jump on that. Put some blocks up here, not tall enough for baby to jump on, not going to breed. Very picky, these villagers. Each pair can breed up to two times a day, so it's actually going to be beneficial to make sure that they have two extra beds, one for each villager. And the thing is, if we want to keep using these same villagers to breed with, we need to make sure that we get these babies out of here before they can claim these beds. So this is one way you can do it where you then just come in, you take out uh, the adults and you put them in the cells, uh, I mean stores, and then you come back and you break the beds and you replace them so they're unclaimed. But we want to do this automatically. So we'll get to that part. But that's the basics of villager breeding. If you have villagers that are showing hearts, but then are showing the angry particles and not spitting out babies, that is because they do not have access to a successful bed. So they will try and breed under other conditions as long as they think they have access to a bed. But if they don't think a baby that has access to the bed, then they won't. So that bed right there is not an eligible bed because this is stopping them from thinking they can reach it. But common theme with these villagers, trap doors, they think they can path through. So now they do recognize this is a valid bed, even though there's a hole there and this wall in front. These guys are just... Dude, you're just staring at a wall. So we can use that to get rid of the babies. The babies are going to be attracted to want to jump on the bed, so they're going to be attracted to an open bed. So we're going to see those little babies want to reach this bed because they think they can walk over the trap doors because they think they're open, but instead they fall into the hole. So that's really it for breeding. We're going to get into more details when we actually get to the breeders. Next, we're going to talk about villager professions and trading. First things first, if you see a villager in a green jacket, do not try to give him a job. Okay, he can breed, but this is a nitwit. He will never take a job. No matter what you do, no matter how many workstations you give him, he will never take a job. All he can do is breed and socialize. You will find these guys wandering around villages that you discover. They only spawn when the village is generated in the world. You used to be able to get them as a random chance from breeding villagers, but that's no longer the case. In Java, you can only find these guys just naturally generated. When you come to village, you may see so that some villagers already have a job, so this farmer already has his farmer's hat on. But if we take away his job, he's going to lose it. And you may see, so he's right over there, even though we replace his workstation, not the same guy is going to come grab it. So that guy came all the way from over there to acquire this job. So if you're working on any type of villager hall and you are re-rolling villagers or you're getting villagers to take their initial job and you have a problem where the workstation that you place down, the guy's just not taking the job, you have one of two issues. Either A, the guy's a nitwit. I know that uh, a lot of us really know about this, but I see this come up on Reddit all the time. Or B, someone else is claiming that workstation or the guy wants another workstation that he sees. Just because you put it down, it's not necessarily the closest villager that will grab onto that workstation. Once he does have a job and we trade with him at least once, he will now not change jobs or lose his job once his workstation is gone. However, without his workstation, he cannot refill his trades. Once you buy a villager out of their current stock, so let me just buy all the bread I can from him. We can see now his bread is sold out. Once he works again at his workstation, he will then restock those trades. And then once he's done his two cells of each of those items throughout the day, he needs to wait until the next workday in order to be able to restock again. Unless you break the game. This is one of the things we're going to cover when it comes to the concept of void trading, which is going to be the third level of the farm. So we'll cover that when we get there of how you can keep a villager from getting locked. As for moving villagers to where you want them to go, there are a few main ways. One is to get them to walk into a boat and then get in the boat with them, and you can boat them where you want to go. You can also get them in a minecart and push them along rails or use power rails to mobilize them. You can do what is commonly referred to as workstation pulling, where you put down a workstation, get the villager to track it, break it before he gets there, and then place it down further away. You can push them with water. You can push them with a piston. You can move them with shulker bullets if you're really creative. I don't know what good that would be used for, though. 
but I'll leave that to you. In the basic design, we're going to see we're going to be using boats just because I think they're the easiest early game. You don't have to get any iron for rails. And then later on, we are going to be using rails because it's very easy to automate rails, unlike the other methods. Another thing to note with that process of the zombie villagers, once you cure a zombie villager, he is going to give you much better deals on his trades. So he will sell things for cheaper and buy things for less resources. So you can then use a zombie to turn your villagers into zombie villagers. And then whichever player clicked on the villager with the golden apple will then receive discounts. But here, now we can buy one glowstone for only one emerald. This can stack too. You can see that the Rotten Flesh, he's still taking 26 for one emerald. So we could re-zombify him and re-cure him. And he will give me even better prices again because I was the player that right-clicked on him with the Golden Apple. In my opinion, if you start getting into the later levels though and you start having a raid farm, the cost of the time that it takes to brew the weakness potions and the Golden Apples and waiting for them to cure, in my opinion, just isn't worth it. Raid farm is going to get you so many emeralds. On the other hand, I like the idea of the mechanics, so I, I really would be fine with raid farms getting a big nerf. But that's just personal opinion. You can take that how you want. Once again, just like the void trading I said was OP, I think raid farms are OP, but I still shamelessly use them. So enough yammering about these little idiots. I mean, useful helpers. Let's get into the designs. When you get into the world download, this is what you're going to come into. There will be three command blocks to teleport you to the different locations. So we're just going to go through these uh, in numerical order, level one, level two, and then level three. Level three, the void training, in my opinion, is completely OP. If you disagree with that, that's fine. Here's the thing. I think it's OP. I still use it. So this is level one. This is quick and dirty. This is meant to be that you haven't been to the nether yet. You're just in your early days of your single player world or your server, and you just need to get a few villagers up for doing some initial trading. First, we'll talk breeder. This is a very simple setup. So once again, we just use cobblestone, just some trap doors, just a very easy setup. Once you get to the village, you can actually just get the beds from going around to the different houses and taking the beds out of there. You just need to get two villagers in here. And it looks like we're going to actually see them breed so we can see what happens. You notice there is a hole in that trapdoor section right there. So when that baby wants to run over the beds to do some jumping on the bed, he's actually going to fall right down into that hole where he is then going to get carried by the water over here to this section. There is then a trapdoor over his head. And the reason we've done that is this is a really basic villager sorter so that we can keep the babies in one spot get the adults in a different spot because we don't need to get the babies into an area with a workstation they won't take a job what's going to happen is when they grow up their heads are going to pop through this trap door and they're going to come up into this waterway get sucked up into the water and then pushed over to the corner here this is not 100 percent liable by any means but early game this requires no redstone this requires no special materials it's a couple of trap doors and a bucket of water so sometimes you are going to have some villagers that pop up and take a little bit of damage when they come up, but they'll heal up when you do some trades with them. So I'm just going to summon some baby villagers up here just so we can see this happening in a little bit faster timing. So you can see there one of our guys took a little bit of damage, but it's fine. Again, this is a very easy setup. We do need to make sure that there's a too high wall around this whole thing so no villagers can just think that they can walk up and hop over this wall to get to these beds, otherwise they will claim them. And then when we want to breed more baby villagers, we just come over here and toss the food over the wall. When you're ready to get a villager out, just put a boat down, gently push it over and get ready to get in the boat. And now I got my villager in a boat, I can take him anywhere over land. If you are in a situation where you need to get up a ledge in order to get where you want to move the villager, you can do that either by getting them out of the boat and then workstation pulling them, or you can use this little setup. Put a lever here and then put a note block under that block. That will then, when you turn it on, update the piston and quasi-connectivity power it. So once again, that will only work on Java. Otherwise, you can just take a lever and put it right down next to the piston. That will also work. This is just my preferred method because it's easier to just boat on top of the piston and instead of having to try and reach that lever, it's just right in front of you. So that's the breeding for level one. Next up is going to be the actual trading hall. Before we move in there, make sure you have a way to stop lightning. If a lightning strikes a villager, 
that villager will turn into a witch. There is no way to revert it back. If you have just one block over the villager's head, thinking that this keeps them safe, if that lightning strikes this block, it will go through the block to the villager. If you have three villagers next to each other and one of the villagers gets struck with lightning, that will be enough to spread to the other villagers and you will now have three witches. So that one villager that you rolled for 42 minutes so you could get your silk touch and chance, you could finally start doing silk touch, is now a witch is the worst feeling in the world. Lightning rods are so cheap and only three pieces of copper. Just get one, put one within 128 blocks of all your villagers and keep them safe. So we got our villager in a boat. We now want to get him into a trading cell. You could do this with minecarts. Again, if you have the rails to do it, go ahead and just place down rails to face into those things. One thing to note, though, is keeping a villager inside of a minecart in his cell is going to be a little extra laggy. So you have the lag of the villager. You have the lag of the minecart, especially if you're doing this in your spawn chunks. I really recommend, unless you have a reason for keeping them in, like with the void trader, try and get those minecarts back into a container just not taking up more lag than they need to. However, I did say this was going to be without rails because we didn't have that much iron yet. So I'm going to get in the boat and you notice I have these patterns here. So I have this two tall and then it's three wide. We can just line up straight with the two tall boat right into the wall and get out and move backwards. And I'll do that again in survival mode to show you. So take the boat, center it, go straight into the wall, Exit the boat and walk backwards. And then you want to take a slab. Slab is definitely my preference. You can use a trap door, but remember, trap doors, they think they can pathfind through. So if you put a trap door here and then a lectern over here, that guy thinks that he can get through this trap door to that lectern. So he will want that. The guy that you put in here is going to be not interested because it's that guy's lectern. So I like to use a slab and then we're just going to break the boat. Then we can just put down our lectern or whatever workstation we want, and we can start rolling them. Once again, notice this guy did not take a job, and I said, well, even though he's covered by that, this workstation is accessible to every villager in the village. So this guy right here is coming over to take that lectern. Make sure you close off your trading hall. And now we can trade with him. No enchanted books. There we go. We got Mendic. Not a great price, but we got Mendic. One thing to note is don't do this until you have the emeralds to purchase your thing. Because if we have mending right here and we go run off to do things to get our emeralds, say we get some, you know, sticks to sell and some iron to sell. And we come back the next day and sell it all. And we come back and suddenly he's selling projectile protection. You need to lock in a villager's trades in order for it to stay. Otherwise, he will re-roll himself eventually. So now look at that. I've got the best enchant of the game, Bane of Arthropods 5. I wonder if there's too much sarcasm in this video. Nah. We'll buy it. Now he's locked in. At this point, what I like to do once I've got them locked in is then take away their workstation from the front, break out the block right behind them at their feet, and put down their workstation there. They can still work at that workstation, but now I have easier access to the villager. Now you've got nice easy access to the villager and the XP that he's going to let out. We can go ahead and use our trap door in this scenario because at this point we have him locked in. So he will no longer be trying to take worse stations from other people. He already has a job. He's employed. We do need to have these two blocks open because the boats are too wide and you want to make sure that you can fit that in there. Again, if you're using the mine carts, it doesn't really matter. And then you can make yourself a nice haul of villagers with nice easy access. Then, like we mentioned earlier, you could zombify these guys to get better prices. So you can just trade out these walls for trapdoors again. Find yourself a nice juicy zombie and lure him into your villager hall. And lock him in. He's going to go around and start attacking the villagers. If he gets stuck on you, just close off his vision to you. If you do this with villagers that you have already traded with, you don't need to worry about these zombie villagers despawning. If you do it before you've traded with the villagers, these guys can despawn. So just keep that in mind. We can see that all of our villagers that have the slabs in front of them are safe. All the ones we did the trap doors are now zombies. So I'm just going to hop back in here and take care of this zombie. And then we can start converting them back. You do want to also do this when they're in their cells because if they are out of their cells and next to each other, just remember they're going to turn back at random times. It's not going to all be at once. 
So you could have this guy turn back into a villager, and then this zombie villager attacks him. Turns him back into a zombie. Then this guy turns into a villager, but now this guy's still a zombie and attacks him back. Then this guy turns, but then these guys attack him. But before that happens, this guy turns, and then he... Just separate your villagers. And now all of these guys are going to give me discount pricing. So that's going to be it for this level of design. Uh, we are going to look real quick before we get on to level two um, at just a quick cut of a build that I've been working on for a while. And this is the perfect video to release it in. So this will also be in the world download. So when you're at spawn, you can turn over here and you can get this bonus build. This has a little bit of redstone to it, but it is mostly the same concepts that we just covered there with just keeping villagers in separate cells and not really controlling them, but moving them in with a minecart. So let's take a look at this real quick. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. This has been a build that's been in the works for a while. We started this back on Syndicate, and it kind of took us a while to get to the point where we were uh, ready to call it done. Ironically, void trading has become such a staple with us now, though, that I don't know if this is ever going to get built. So we decided let's go ahead and release it on this world download video. So this will be here. You can come through and look at it. We do have two sides of three rows of villagers each. Now, when I pasted in this schematic, there were some issues with the villagers not taking their jobs because the job blocks get pasted kind of funny in the code. But these guys are sealed off so that you don't have to worry about them trying to take other job blocks because they have the slab there and that block up there. They don't think that they can get through or any of these ones can get out to their workstation. Each floor has these waterways on the edge of it. That is for two reasons. One, that is for when you're making your trades, you can throw the items into that water stream. And it will carry all your items over here to a sorting system where we have filter slices that we can sort out different items or to just the bulk storage area if it's either an unstackable or one of those items that you're not commonly trading. But it also serves the purpose of restocking us when we're out of emeralds. So let's say I'm doing a bunch of trading with masons. I'm out of emeralds. Shoot, what do I do? Let me right click a note block. And here comes a shulker of emeralds ready for me to pick up. And then I can go back to trading. If I'm done with the emeralds, I can also just throw them back into the water stream as well. They're going to get carried off. And then there is a mixed shulker box loader for both emerald blocks and emeralds back there that will then deposit that shulker into this chest here. The way that we're doing the call for emeralds, this was done by the Clotzerify. So this is a call system where on each floor we can call for a shulker box of emeralds. And what it's going to do is select the floor to send it to. It's going to shoot the shulker box through some fire into a cobweb so it burns and then it explodes. The items stay in the cobweb and then fall down into the water where they get sent off to the floor that you called it from. So there are call buttons along the walls for each floor that you can use to call for some emeralds.
This, like I said, is a manual load station, so you've got to actually take out a piece of the wall and send villagers on this minecart rail. What you can do then is you can come down to the end, start filling them in from this side, and then start locking these off so that it turns the rails and then sends the villagers so it'll go through here. Then this one we turn it so the next villager come through here, and so on and so forth. That being said, you're still going to have to move in all those villagers with... I mean, there's a little assistance. You can use a minecart rail... You can put a villager breeder up inside the ceiling there and drop them out, but you've still got to do it manually. So let's get into level two and get into my auto villager hall version two. For those of you who have been watching my channel before and already seen my video on the auto villager hall version 1.4, this is going to look very similar. Um, we've got some minor differences with the redstone lamps, but the setup here is the same. However, this is a complete redesign. This is now my Auto Villager Hall version 2. The whole point of this is to handle most of the functions of villager trading for us automatically. Really, the only thing we're going to have to do manually is roll villagers and trade with villagers. Everything else is going to handle them. I have here the different colored concretes that we're using in this, and this is something I'm going to try and get better at in the future. Obviously, if you know my channel, you know I like to build with black and yellow. Tell me down in the comments if you know why. But this sort of got so complex that I figured I should probably include the different colors for the different circuits. So right over here, we have our key for what all the different colors are, and we're going to go through those. Before we go through all that, though, I'm just going to show what the basic use of it is. So right now we have an empty hall. There are no villagers. What we want to do is we want to push a button, get a villager dropped into a cell, assign him a workstation, be able to roll them until we get what we want. And keep him locked in there. And when you want another villager, you just press a button. And roll that guy. We also want to be able to zombify them. Cure them. And get them back to their workstation. So that we can get those discounted trades. We also want this process to be repeatable so that other people can also cure. We also want to be able to lock slices. So let's say I know that I want to have more librarians than these slices. I can come over here and flick these levers. Those slices are now closed. So the next villager is going to land in the next open cell, meaning the light is on and there is no villager in it. And then we can turn this guy into whatever profession we want. Then when I want to start getting my librarians back in, I can just come unlock these cells. We have an indicator lamp here for when you have villagers available. That's also this same lamp line that's right here. So that will be off when there are no villagers available to call with these call buttons. And then they will turn back on with a little notification when we have a villager available. We also have an auto breeder. We'll go over that in just a moment so that we're getting villagers sent to us automatically for availability. And then we have the option to either send them to zombification or to yeet them. Because you may work on getting a librarian leveled up or maybe a stonemason leveled up to get you something in particular. Toolsmith, something like that. They don't give you what you want and you want to get rid of them. If you were to kill this guy in the middle of a full hall, a bunch of the villagers would start giving you bad trades. So we just have a button. Change it over to yeet mode. We're going to get rid of him. And he will haunt us no longer. I've also included a shulker box display for emeralds, so you can grab emeralds, and when that runs out, it'll give you a new box. So that's the premise of how you would use this villager hall, but now I want to go through the actual concepts of the circuits working here, so that you can know what's going on behind the scenes if you decide to build this. This up top here is your bulk standard villager breeder. There are farmer villagers in here. They don't all need to be farmers, but they will harvest a little bit faster if they are. You can see that just happened there. We also want to use carrots here because wheat will give you seeds that can fill up their inventory and potatoes can give you poison potatoes, which can also fill up their inventory. Carrots just drop carrots. They will walk around, harvest those carrots, and then use those to make their own breeding. You notice here's the slot where they want to try and get through. There's the hole for the babies. And then for each villager in there, they have their own bed. And then there is two beds per breeding pair. So just think of it as two beds per villager. 
They will then automatically breed. The babies will drop down into this chute, into this system right here. This is the Baby Villager Sorter by Methods. I'm going to put a link down in the video description to his YouTube video on this. Uh, but he designed the system so that it would 100% reliably be able to sort out the baby villagers and the adult villagers. You can see the system is very cheap. A lot of this doesn't even need to be glass. Uh, probably the most expensive thing is this piece of soul sand. It means you do need to visit the nether there. but And it will reliably keep these babies in this cell right here. When they grow up, they grow up through the slab and they get pulled up into the water or they float up in the water and moved over here. We have powdered snow here so that they don't take any damage when they fall. The fall damage is something important. In my first version of this, that was meant to be either for a single player scenario or for a server that was a competitive server where you're not having other people use your same hall. So having them take a little bit of damage on the way in didn't matter because as you would trade with them and level them up, uh, they would get healed or again, when they get zombified and healed again, uh, then that damage would heal. In a multiplayer situation, once that villager is all leveled up, he's not gonna recover any health without health potions. So we needed to make sure that we negate the damage that they were taking, which is one of the main reasons why this all got redesigned. Uh, there were a couple of other reasons, you know, like reliability, working right, not breaking. So that's all over here, and that's the orange line. So that's orange concrete used for calling new villagers outside of the breeder. What we're actually doing to call one of those is using the signal on the green line. We can see that green line comes down here throughout the floor of the hall. So all of these buttons work on that same call system, so you can call a villager from wherever you are in the hall. And I'm going to get ready to push this. I'm going to go into free cam so that you can see what's going on here. So the villager got picked up there, sent over here, dropped on the hunting block, hunting block retracted, sent down into here, into this mob conveyor system where it then fell into the next available slot, hit the string, closed the carpet on top of it. Let's do this in slow motion. So I'm going to press the button in free cam here. The game is now running at 5 TPS. We see the minecart comes out. Grabs a villager through that setup there, sends him over here, activates the activator rail, kicks him out on top of that honey block, which then immediately retracts, drops him down onto water so he's safe. And then this piston mob conveyor pushes him in, where he then falls into that slot, hits the string, and this sticky piston pushes the carpet on top of him. Now, in my design, this carpet being on their head is vital because if you were to send a zombified villager back in here, without the carpet on their head, then the zombified villager would be able to track onto that villager as it walked past. And then when it fell into this slot, attack it through that trap door right there. Obviously we don't want this cascade effect. So you need to make sure that all your villagers have blocks on their heads. We're using carpet to screw with their pathfinding so they can't try and pathfind out of there. Originally we were using glass blocks, but the problem is sometimes they would try and jump on that to try and find their way to a solid block. Once you fill up this side of the hall or you lock this whole side of the hall, they can then go to the other side of the hall because the conveyor pushes them here into this bubble column, which moves them over. In the first design, we were just using the mob conveyor to go all the way around, so it was a little bit faster. This is a little nicer because if you want to make the entrance to your hall bigger, all you need to do is just raise up that bubble column a little bit more, and then they just fall right down into here where they don't take damage on that water block. And then we have this string here on both sides. That is what is actually starting this mob conveyor. So I don't have to worry about uh, it going off if a villager's not in there or he's not ready yet or worrying about timings for getting him over here. It's just whenever he drops in, that's when the mob conveyor is going to start. Here, this brown line up top, that's where we can see there is a trip wire in between these villagers. So whenever there is a villager inside of there, it's going to light up this line right here. And once it's done kicking him out, it's either going to send the empty minecart back on the orange rail, back to the villager call system, or on the lime rail to have minecarts available to pick up villagers that we want to zombify or remove from the hall. So I'm once again going to show this in free cam. We're going to send this guy down. we got to make sure we send him down when they have a workstation or a block in front of them. Because we went with this system with the slabs and stairs here so that we could get XP out from underneath there. If I was to press this button and that was to open, this guy would be able to walk out if he chose to. So just put his workstation in there so he can't wander out. But when we push that button, that's going to power this note block. That's going to push out the sticky piston with the sticky block and the stair. He's going to then be able to fall in between the sticky block and the sticky piston. When the note block becomes unpowered because the button is undepressed. 
unpushed returned to unpushed state i think that's it return to unpushed state he's going to fall through this trip wire hook right here and then a minecart is going to get sent out to pick them up. We have the water pushing them over so that they're always next to the rail. We don't have to rely on them by chance going on there. Where he gets sent into the bubble column, up into the cyan area, which is the zombification area. Zombie setup is pretty simple. We have this slab here so the zombie can't see us. There is just a trapdoor separating him and the villager in the minecart. In this case, we've given him a sword so that he can kill them faster. We name tagged him first to make sure that he wouldn't despawn. And then they come out of the cyan line and then they go back to the light blue line. Light blue is possible zombie villager returning. So that's why we have it completely covered up from sky axis so that your zombie villager doesn't burn. And then he gets dropped back into the same system. The light gray line here is real simple. It's just a lever that moves up to the redstone line, which is then going to push a block in front of these villagers paths so that they don't think that they have access to beds. The gray line here is just the T flip flop for the mode selector between zombification and removal. And then the pink line is where we actually send them in this case to be removed. And that's how this hall works. I do want to get into a couple of the nitty gritties of this because there are some things about it that I'm still not completely happy with. Uh, definitely keep an eye out on the Glotzerify on his YouTube channel. He said he is going to be releasing a video soon on his villager trading hall design. Uh, you know, maybe bug him in his Twitch chat if he hasn't released it yet to, you know, hey, where's that video? Because I want to see it because his system is really nice and clean and it solves a couple of the problems that I'm going to bring up here. So keep an eye on his YouTube channel for that. Because we are using trapdoors here to separate villagers and to keep them inside their cell when there's no workstation, this villager right here thinks that he can walk anywhere in this hall. So if I was to have a line of villagers that were unassigned workstations and put down a workstation... See, in that case, that guy grabbed it. So if I was to have a line of villagers all in a row and didn't assign them workstations yet, and I wanted to give this guy a workstation, we don't know which one of these guys, or even this guy over here, is going to try and grab that workstation. So i put it there. We'll try that guy. Oh, see, right next to it. Got it. That's not what we want. Which means you do need to roll your villagers as they are coming in. And I'm not going to say exactly how, because that's not my place. That's for Glotz's video, but he has a way to solve that. But as long as you roll them as they're coming in, you won't have any issues with them grabbing their workstation. One of the things I did want in this system is having the string down at their feet level because I always hate having something up by their face level where you can accidentally click on it and not click the villager because if you want to just go down villagers in a line, it's nice to not accidentally open your trap doors. So that's why we have the redstone blocks with the iron trap doors here and then not accidentally click on string so we can click right on the villager. We did have to move in the villager drop point because they do need to land again on that water so they don't take damage, which means that they need some time to be able to fall down to this carpet level before they get to the first cell right here. Because I worked for a, probably about four hours on updating this design to something that um, it was using some water inside the system because this was then higher up and we had like double locking to make sure that everything was great but then the problem is you couldn't use the first six cells which is terrible so i ended up going with this but that does mean that with this locking technically if this villager is in here and i do the slice locking i've now actually opened up his cell and if that was a zombie villager or there's a zombie villager next to him that guy can start jumping they can aggro on and then attack him so it still means that you have to make sure you don't lock a slice that already has a villager in it if you don't have any zombie villagers in your hall at the time, it's not the end of the world. It just means that you're going to have to make sure you come back and click that. We still had to use powdered snow to make sure that they don't take any damage in this really short drop. But one of the reasons we need to make sure they don't take any damage there and they're not taking any damage coming back into the system each time is because this is also what they're going to use to return if you wanted to turn this yeeting option into a void trading option. So that's going to be it for version two of the design. Uh, in the world download, I am going to fill this up with villagers because I still want to take this for yet another round of testing. It was a long testing process to get this change in place and get it reliable. So I want to do yet another round of testing. And if all goes well, then you'll just see this design here with all this filled up with villagers. You can come in, grab a schematic, take out the villagers, whatever you want to do there. But now we're going to move on to level three, which is void trading, which is just 
in my opinion, absolutely OP, but we're going to go for it. And you may be asking yourself right now, what is void trading? What are you talking about? So real quick, before we go look at the setup, when we have a villager that we're trading with and we right click on him to open his GUI, we can see that this is going to stay open until we either exit it or we change dimension. That means that even if we are in the process of moving, so I'm going to click on the villager while I'm in the waterway moving, and we're going to see that no matter how far away I move from him, this is going to stay open. As long as, once again, I don't change dimensions while this is open, this will remain open. However, if we move far enough away that this guy is no longer loaded, what's going to happen is we can leave this open, make the trade, sell it out, but the villager will not be loaded by the game in order to mark this villager as currently sold out of that item. So when we come back and reload him, it will be like it never happened. We have our items in our inventory or we have sold our items to get our emeralds. This guy will not be locked out of his trade though. He has to be unloaded though. And that's why I say, you know, doing that in the overworld, there aren't many ways to propel yourself at that speed to do it. I mean, you know, Pearl Cannon in the overworld, but getting that to go well, opening a villager's GUI and yeah, it'd be weird, but um, if you do it, I kind of want to see it. So we are not going to do this in the overworld or the nether. We're going to use a place where we can teleport around instantly. The end. The most optimal way to do this is going to be to get one of your end gateways and then break out the bedrock around it. And then you can use this gateway to go to the other gateway out in the islands and return back. And we can use this system right here so that we can not even have to move our mouse or press our keyboard button in order to be able to do it. Now, I see what you're saying here. Normally the third level means that we come up with ideas where you have to do something crazy or something that's uh, some people would consider game breaking, like in this instance, breaking the bedrock. And that's why I have this version over here. So this is a version of a void trader that does not require any bedrock breaking. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the explanation. But first I want to continue talking about what void trading is and how it's going to work. So I went through the gateway and I have my trading hall here. Now you can build that auto villager trading hall that we saw for level two there. Uh, you could build Glotz's trader hall. You could build your own specific one. Me personally, when I'm doing void traders, I'm not really looking to get, you know, a bunch of different librarians and buy up that many books. It's not really a priority for me, but if that's a priority for you, then by all means, go ahead. What I'm using it for is those main blocks that you want to mass a lot of. So, you know, a lot of glazed terracotta, a lot of quartz, your drip stones, your bookshelves, your glass blocks, your name tags, redstone, glowstone, bottles of enchanting, uh, some golden carrots. So this design of the hall I have right here, this will work. We do have a zombification chamber option here, so you can either send them to the Void Trader or to the zombie negotiations. However, you could leave this part off because usually if you're good with Void Trading, I think you're good with raid farms. And if you have a good raid farm on your server, who cares about prices? You know, sell me Silk Touch for 64 emeralds, see what I care. So we have the haul option here where we can send them to the Void Trader. And then here is the amazing awesome auto villager breeder we don't need that much you can grab the breeder system from version 2 that has the automatic villager breeder along with methods baby villager sorter system and use that however in this case we're just back to kind of a manual system where i would throw some bread at them because once i've got these villagers set and i don't have that many slots here i don't really need any villagers bread anymore so this gives me a little more control because i'm the one giving them the food in order to breed with and then this is also very similar to the system we saw in the first version where we just have a wall there so that they get their hitboxes pushed forward a bit. And then we're just going to dispense a minecart to handle them. If you do come up here to send a minecart and you've got baby villagers in your way, this is so easy. You just punch the baby villagers until you get an adult. But this level is much less about the actual breeder and the trading hall system itself. So maybe I was a little bit false advertising, but technically this is another design of villager hall. It does have slice locking, so it won't send villagers into duplicate slices. So it will turn those rails in order to send them on their way. This is about the void trading. So let's get back to it. This is how void trading works. You're going to call a villager over. 
That villager is then going to get put right here. We have some lava on the sides to help burn up some of the excess XP so that it doesn't start falling down here and landing on an island and just existing. Then you as the player, you're going to get into the water stream. And before you get into the portal, you're going to right click on the villager. So now we have his inventory open. I can trade him out of all his redstone. So that's locked. Let's do his glowstone too. Sure, why not? I can exit his inventory. And when I open this barrel, all I have to do is right click on this barrel. And it's going to push me back. We can see his stuff isn't actually locked now because he was unloaded when I did that. Now, if you had another player over at that hall, that would lock him because he was loaded. But now I can do this process repeatedly. And we can see that every time I go back, that trade is now unlocked. That time you'll see right there, you notice I got a little bit trigger happy and went a little too early. So when I go back, his trade is now locked. So it does take a little bit of practice to get this down, but once you do, you can just trade with him indefinitely until you are out of emeralds. So now that I've accidentally locked him, I need to send him back to his workstation so that he can restock during work hours. So what the game is doing is when you go through one of these gateways for the first time, it then links up to the gateway out at the end islands that it corresponds to. However, the position that it teleports the player to that is not linked so each time you go through the portal they are linked to each other but then it's going to search around the portal for solid blocks it's going to search above it it's going to search at the level of it and then finally it's going to start searching below it so if we have just this one solid block here at the same level of the portal we can control where we're going to teleport to when we go through and that also applies to the other side. All of these are bottom half slabs, so we can't teleport to those. But right there, we have a solid concrete block. The bedrock does not count, and so that's why we put down a concrete block next to it. And that's going to be the same principle over here, except in this case, we're using the dispenser as the block to teleport to. So you just need to make sure that around here, you see we have you know bottom half slabs, here's walls, uh, things that can't be teleported to. This does not count because an extended piston is not a solid block, so we can't teleport on top of that. And again, even though these are above it, these are bottom half slabs, we can't teleport to that. So if you start building this and you decide to uh, build some deco around this, just make sure that you're checking when you're teleporting through. And if you teleport to an area that you didn't intend, like you suddenly come out here, you just need to make sure that you move that further away from the gateway. So we can see how much faster this is actually going to be able to go. Then doing this in an overworld method. So if you get good with your trading, you can actually do one trade about every five seconds using this method. Now, in this case, we did build this out on the outer end islands. Um, if you are on a server, I would recommend that just because there is a chance that a player may come to the end, maybe to check on your concrete factory or you have some kind of uh, map art that they want to work on in the end. And if another player, once again, has that villager loaded, that will lock it. It's not that difficult to move these guys over to an end island. Once again, whether you're doing the bedrock breaking or non-bedrock breaking method. All we need to do is send the villager into that portal. Again, if you're not breaking the bedrock, you are going to be able to do this, but your villager is going to take a point of damage. So I'm going to villager, minecart. He's going to go into the portal, and he's going to come out on the other side where we place down some solid blocks. So he won't teleport inside this bedrock as long as we put some solid blocks over here. If you are on a single player world, by all means, go ahead and build this over on the main island because you're going to be the only person who's loading those chunks on the main island. So you can just get your villager to the end platform and then bring them up here. You don't have to do that. And then your end gateway out in the end islands would actually be your station then. And before we go, I did promise I would talk about this. I do understand there are plenty of people out there that either cannot or do not want to break bedrock. Sometimes people are playing on a server where that type of thing is actually disabled, like breaking bedrock. Um, if you're playing on you know, a paper server, for example, that's disabled by default. And then some people just feel that bedrock should not be broken in the game because that was the intention of bedrock, that it's an unbreakable block. If that's the case, that's fine. You can still do this. So as you may or may not know, trap doors, if you're standing in a trap door and then close the trap door, will then put you into that crouch mode. And what we have here is we have a dispenser with a water bucket in it. And we have blocks on the side so that the water is only going to flow into that portal. 
Here we are using a glass pane and a fence so that they won't connect. They'll block the water, but they won't connect. But then still allow us to see down through because you can see down there that barrel. That barrel is going to be our activation system. So that barrel is being observed. That will send out our water and retract it for us. So in order to start this up, all I need to do is get under here and close this trap door. Look at the barrel. Right click it. Once again, I only need to right click it. I don't need to do anything else. It's going to send me the end gateway. And then it's going to send me back. We have the same villager hall design over here. All I've done on this side is once again, we have this already with the water stream there covered up with this trap door so that the player stays in the crawl mode so that they can get pushed into the portal. And then we have trap doors here on the side, once again with the glass pane not connected to anything so we can still access because right here where this glass pane is, is where our villager will be. So to get back to the main island, all I gotta do is open that button, put me in crawl mode and push me in. So now I'm going to show you we can still do void trading at the same speed without breaking the bedrock. And there we go. So we were able to get a bunch of redstone through void trading, no bedrock broken. Bedrock players, I'm sorry, but I cannot confirm or deny that anything works in Bedrock Edition. Um, I don't know if void trading works. I don't know um, how the villager breeding works. Uh, I don't know if you have pickaxes in the game. I'm sorry. That is going to be it for this episode. Once again, thank you so much for checking it out. And there will be a world download down in the video description where you can see all three of these setups that were reviewed here. I know there's been a lot of sarcasm in this video, but I have actually had a lot of fun doing this video. Um, I had a lot of fun with that intro, probably one of my favorite intros yet. And then doing the redesign on this, uh, not two times, but three times, was actually fun in the end when it actually ended up working. So thanks to each and every one of you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoy seeing down in the comments people commenting on what they were going to use these types of builds for or ideas they had for changes to suit their own needs. So by all means, leave us down in the comments. Uh, let's do a secret passphrase. Let's say that if you made it to this point, um, villagers are glorious. Let's leave that down in the comments. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.